afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm Jamal Benomar and um, I'm chair of ICDI. Um, I'm going to be the moderator for the meeting today. Um, just two things, well, about myself, I, uh, I chair ICDI. Previously, I was with the UN for 25 years. One of the highlights of my uh, career was assignments in various parts of uh, the Middle East, including in Iraq, and five years as special envoy, the UN special envoy to um, Yemen. I left the UN as um, UN Under Secretary General for Conflict Prevention. Um, USIP doesn't need an introduction, but let me say a couple of words about ICDI. ICDI is the first independent platform in the MENA region that is dedicated to mediation, uh, conflict resolution, and promoting dialogue. It was created um, by veterans of UN mediation, a group of um, eight um, uh, under sector generals, um, all with deep roots in the region, all from the, uh, the region. Um, the ICDI serves as a platform for generating, analyzing, and um, testing homegrown ideas that could enable key parties in conflict to reach negotiated settlement. Um, we mobilize expertise in our part of the world in support of track one and track two initiatives. And we aim at empowering local actors to take action and uh, take initi initiatives in the field of mediation and conflict resolution instead of relying on um, uh, foreign-led, um, the usual foreign-led efforts. Um, let me um, uh, 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 set a bit of context um, um, to our uh, conversation. Um, um, we're delighted to have um, a powerful group of experts, you know, in this in this meeting, and I'm I'm going to introduce our um, uh, speakers. Uh, but first, let me um, uh, say a few things about you know, the focus of this meeting, a lot has been said really about the impact of the Ukraine-Russia um, um, crisis um, on the Middle East in terms of uh, food supplies, um, nutrition, uh, agriculture, um, oil and gas, and economic issues. But we have seen very little really when it comes to how this new crisis um, uh, that captures the attention of the world, how its impact is going to be on the dynamics of the ongoing conflicts that we see throughout the MENA region, um, in Libya, in Syria, um, uh, in Yemen, and, um, and if you want, you, know, you can include some other countries where the headline also is deadlock, like Lebanon and, um, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and Iraq. Um, the, um, as we have seen in, in, in Libya, there have been 10 years of, more than 10 years of international mediation, um, elections held in 2012, 2014, um, an attempt to organize elections a few months ago, um, they've been postponed, um, various agreements from the Sherat agreement to more recent agreements, um, but still the country is, uh, has fragmented, um, uh, there is a, a polarization um, um, in the political scene, and um, um, many believe that there is um, uh, there, there is still no real light at the end of of the tunnel. But in Libya, also, what we see here is the involvement of a wide variety of actors, um, all competing for influence and um, fending for their economic interest, um, starting with. NATO countries who are close to Libya, like uh, Italy, France, UK, um, um, to other actors like um, uh, UAE, Turkey, um, and Russia, of course. Uh, Russia who maintains a, a, a presence you know, in the country through, um, uh, uh, through mercenaries or other uh, alliances with uh, one of the uh, critical actors, um, um, Mr. Haftar. Um, so um, it is 
not clear, um, and this is one thing we can explore, you know, what are the prospects for peace in, in, in Libya and what this new dynamic in the international scene that involves Russia would mean for the country and for uh, the prospect of stability and um, peace in, in, in Libya. We have also another country where the headline has been um, uh, uh, deadlock, also that's Syria. Um, half of the, the country um, population became refugees, um, scattered in Europe and around the world. Um, uh, the government seemed to have prevailed militarily, um, but not a total victory. Um, um, instability continues and um, the involvement of many actors from the region and beyond are still, um, um, are still there, including the a Russian military presence in the country that helped um, change the tie in favor of, 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 of the government. We don't hear much about prospects for peace and mediation in Libya. Um, it started with um, high level appointments, uh, Kofi Annan, um, Lahdar Brahimi and the UN at the center of everything, but um, uh, the UN is nowhere to be seen these days in, 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 in Syria. And um, we don't know exactly what the Ukraine situation would mean. And this is something that we can explore. In Yemen, um, seven year, after seven years of uh, Saudi OE led military intervention, um, the country uh, continued to be as fragmented as ever. Um, uh, according to the UN, it's still the, uh, the largest uh, humanitarian uh, crisis um, that we have seen in recent times. Um, all mediation efforts have failed. Um, and um, after seven years, um, there has been now a, a lull, there's been a, a, a ceasefire, uh, but only for, but it's very tenuous and fragile and only for a period of two months. And uh, we don't know whether it's going to be implemented in full um, flight from uh, Sana'a to um, other countries haven't re resumed and the parties in the conflict are still um, bickering over um, this issue. Um, the, in, uh, in Yemen, um, the Security Council, the P5 were unanimous in their support for a peaceful transition, at least between 2011 and 2015. Um, that was the time when I was the UN Special Envoy to Yemen. Uh, there were no serious divisions over, um, over Yemen in the Security Council. Um, things changed slightly, you know, when the Saudis decided to intervene militarily and when the US, UK and others decided to provide diplomatic cover for the military intervention uh, with resolution 2216 that basically asked one side, the Houthis, to surrender to the another side, um, a government um, living in exile, living in hotels in, in, in Riyadh. Um, um, uh, since then and more recently, you know, we see that uh, Russia signed up, you know, to the OE request to make the Houthis a terrorist organization that a language that was agreed on in the Security Council. And then more recently, um, the Council welcomed the, um, the coup against Hadi, um, um, you know, when the Saudis decided to um, set up a uh, presidential council uh, made up of local warlords. Um, the, the Council did, you know, with no difficulty, it seems, um, uh, welcomed, you know, this. D development. So um, what will be the impact um, of the new situation uh, with the uh, Ukraine crisis and um, this serious rift now in relations between, you know, the um, uh, between Russia and the P3? Um, that's something that we can explore. It still will we'll still um, have to see how this will, will evolve. Anyway, I have some very specific questions that I will ask. But first, um, you know, let me turn to Dr. Michael Yaffe. Um, he's the vice president of 
the Middle East and North Africa Center at the US Institute for Peace. Before joining USIP in 2017, Dr. Yafi served in a variety of positions in the US government, most recently as a senior advisor to both Special Envoy for Israeli Palestinian negotiations and the Special Envoy for Middle East uh, Peace at the US Department of State. Between 2002 and 2012, he was an academic dean and distinguished professor of strategic studies at the National Defense University in Washington. Dr. Michael Yaffe, welcome to the meeting. Delighted to partner with you. Um, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Benamar. Um, and welcome everyone to this webinar focusing on the impact of the Ukraine war on the fragile countries in the Middle East and North Africa region. Uh, let me begin, Dr. Benamar, by expressing my gratitude to you on behalf of USIP uh, for, uh, and to the International Center for Dialogue Initiatives for co-sponsoring this event with us today. USIP was founded in 1984 by an act of Congress to serve as an independent institution dedicated <clears throat> to peace and the prevention, mitigation, and resolution of conflict. Uh, we do this in several ways, including programs on the ground in 16 com conflict afflicted countries, in the mid including in the Middle East, and partnering with organizations like the ICDI. Convening events like today, like the one today, is an important part of our work in order to provide a forum for hearing from a diverse set of knowledgeable individuals, leaders, and experts on very significant issues of today. And I want to thank uh, Eliwa Abououn and the USIP team in Tunis for helping to put together this event. Um, also, let me extend my personal welcome to the four speakers in this program, who Dr. Benamar will be introducing shortly. Uh, Dr. Benamar provided, I thought, a fairly well comprehensive tour de raison of the issues. So I'm not going to repeat any of that, except to say that, that uh, you know, the Middle East is strongly impacted by the ripple effects from the war which began between Ukraine and Russia in just over two months ago. And we're, there's been a lot of focus on the economic side of things, on potential uh, shortages and a surge in food prices, uh, energy investments, and issues of that sort. But I'm glad that Dr. Benamar introduced the idea that we will be also be focusing on the political aspects uh, and the ripple effects of the war on various elements and relations in the region. We already have witnessed that the UN, when looking at the votes uh, with regard to uh, um, uh, uh, on the votes on the war itself and on the votes on the Human Rights Council with regard to Russian membership of how mixed there is a reaction amongst the various states in the Middle East. And that's worth exploring, I think, today as well. In addition to, as uh, Dr. Benamar mentioned, about the impacts of the already ongoing conflicts in the region um, and how, how the Ukraine war will exacerbate those, especially if it becomes a prolonged war um, and, the, and increased sanctions start to bite even harder on Russia. And what is the impact on relations between the countries in the region and Russia, and with the other great powers, China and the United States. And also there's questions about what the international community can do to help mitigate some of the ripple effects, as I mentioned on, uh, on such food shortages, which can provide, which could lead to instability in the region. I also hope that we have opportunities to talk about how, uh, how this changing dynamic may lead to some maybe positive outcomes in terms of uh, maybe new investments in the region, uh, such as reviving the proposed trans-Saharan uh, uh, gas pipeline that would traverse from Nigeria through Algeria to Europe. So I think we should also make, keep those kinds of issues in mind. Anyway, we have a very rich panel of experts and uh, and knowledgeable people who can discuss all these issues. So I'm not gonna take any more of your time with that. And uh, welcome everybody. And again, uh, I look forward to the very rich discussion that's going to happen next and uh, to the moderation of Dr. Benamar. So Dr. Benamar, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Yaffe. Um, 
Let me first introduce our um, speakers. We're delighted to have Minister Najla Mohammed Al Mangush. She's the uh, Libya's first female Minister of Foreign Affairs. She trained as a lawyer at Benghazi University and was later an assistant professor of law there. Um, during Libya's 2011 revolution, she headed the National Transitional Council Public Engagement Unit, which dealt with civil society organizations. Subsequently, she was Fulbright Scholar in the US and is graduate of the Center for Justice and Peace Building at MAU University in Virginia. Um, 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 uh, Dr. Mangush um, uh, has a PhD in conflict analysis and resolution at George, from George uh, Mason University. We're also delighted to have Ambassador Hisham Youssef with us. Um, um, he's well known um, in the region and internationally. He was a Korea diplomat with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Egypt. From 2014 to 2019, he served as Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian, Cultural and Social Affairs of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, OIC, and completed his term in July 2019. From 2001 to 2014, he served as Senior Official in the Arab League, as official spokesman and later the chief of staff of to Secretary General Hamar Musa from 2003 to 2011. And then um, later uh, he was senior advisor to Secretary General of the Arab League, Dr. Nabil Al Arabi, on issues pertaining to crisis management as well as to the reform of the Arab League. We're also delighted to have um, uh, Sarah Lee. Um, Whitson, uh, she's the currently the executive director of Dawn, Democracy for the Arab World Now. She previously was the director for many years, director of the MENA division at Human Rights Watch. She led dozens of advocacy and investigation missions in the Middle East and North Africa, focusing on issues of, um, um, of armed conflict, accountability, rule of law, human rights, and so on. She graduated from University of California, Berkeley and Harvard Law School. She is member of the Council on Foreign Relations. We're also happy to have with us Dr. Yunus Abu Yub. Um, he is the Director of Governance State Building for the MENA region at ESQUA, the United Nations. He was previously Senior Political Advisor to um, uh, Special Representative of Secretary General in, in Libya um, and the Secretary General uh, Special Representative or Envoy for um, Yemen. He worked in um, a number of field missions, including in Darfur, uh, South Sudan, Chad, Ethiopia, um, uh, Burundi, uh, and so on. Um, uh, thank you for uh, being with us, all of you. Um, let me um, kickstart the discussion by asking some, uh, some questions and feel free to answer to um, any one of them. Um, Dr. Yaffe asked, in fact, some of the, the most pertinent questions. I'm just going to expand a little bit on what he said. Um, the key question here, the general one, is how will uh, the crisis in Russian NATO countries' relations translate on the ground uh, in the broader region of the Middle East, North Africa and the Middle East, and particularly in these countries that we mentioned, such as Libya, Syria, and Yemen. If we're going to start with Libya, it's clear that Russian-Turkish coordination in Libya has been one of the mitigating factors preventing the eruption of another round of uh, nationwide fighting among Libyan factions. Um, can we expect changes on the ground? Um, um, we have in Libya um, various NATO members um, engaged uh, from France to um, UK, um, Italy, um, and um, clearly, you know, the, there is a Russian uh, presence um, in the country and um, uh, through Wagner, the infamous Wagner group. And um, uh, uh, it is clear that the Russians have uh, supported um, Mr. Haftar, um, who is based in Benghazi, how this situation is is going to evolve. Um, it's, I think it's um, a pertinent question here. Now, the second question that I would ask is um, concerning Syria. What are the impacts of geostrategic and security in, in geostrategic and security terms 
for the current war on the Russian military presence in, in Syria. Um, Russia emerged as um, um, an important actor in, in, in this conflict and it helped shape one way or another the evolution of this conflict, um, um, how this situation is going to be impacted with the um, tensions that exist now between um, US and Russia, NATO countries and, uh, and Russia. And then, you know, all these countries um, are on the agenda of the Security Council, um, Libya, uh, Yemen, um, uh, Syria. Um, so far, um, it's been too early to determine how the current confrontation over Ukraine is going to translate um, when it comes to mm -hmm. ruin, re renewing mandates, UN mandates on these countries. Um, um, there is one upcoming discussion, it's about humanitarian access, there is a resolution on humanitarian access in, in Syria. Um, uh, there was a lot of bickering in the past about um, uh, uh, this issue and the concept even. Um, if it's now going to be back uh, a discussion, Security Council on this issue, what's going to be the Russian position? Many people believe that the Russia will block you know, the resolution. Um, it, it is going to, um, with deadlock already, uh, prevailing in the Security Council, um, how that deadlock is going to translate when it comes to specifically the situation in Libya, um, uh, Yemen, uh, Syria. But then, you know, um, something that's been alluded to, um, 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 let me play the, devoc the, the, the devil's advocates, um, the shy and, and um, of an ambivalent reaction of most countries in the MENA region clearly did not meet US expectations. Um, the US was disappointed to see, for example, the OE abstaining in the Security Council vote, um, Saudi is turning down requests for stabilizing the oil markets, um, and some people even allege that they're not taking even calls you know, from the United States. Um, is it true or not? Good knows. But, that's been the, what's been reported in the, um, uh, in the US media. Um, so um, what is happening you know, with US allies uh, when it comes to um, their uh, reactions to recent developments uh, regarding Russia and, uh, and the Ukraine? And then um, another question also that is worth asking, will Russian acquiescence to the P3 diplomatic cover for the Saudi OE military intervention in Yemen continue. Um, um, Russia agreed to, as I said, to language referring to the Houthis as terrorist organization. Uh, Russia agreed to language welcoming the Saudi engineered uh, uh, council replacing President Hadi, presidential council replacing President Hadi. Um, and um, will the Russians continue to follow the P3 um, as they did you know, in the uh, last few years in the Security Council? We don't know. Um, we'll only find out you know, once you know, there are uh, more developments um, on the ground. These are some of the um, general questions that I wanted to ask. Um, um, but um, let me start with that Minister um, Najla El Mangush, because she has another uh, engagement. And um, um, uh, Minister El Mangush, be delighted if you can um, tell us something about how um, this situation is going to impact on the um, Libya situation, as I explained in the question that I highlight. Minister El Mangush, you have the floor.
I see Minister Mangush has some technical difficulty joining us. Let's wait a, a, a minute or two and see whether we can have her join the meeting. Minister, can you hear me? I think we may have lost the connection. I think we are going to um, uh, see whether we can reestablish the connection. But in the meantime, let me turn to um, Ambassador Hisham Youssef. Uh, Ambassador Hisham, you know, you are a veteran of uh, diplomacy in the region and you have dealt one way or another with all these conflicts. Um, um, we'll be delighted to hear your insights. You have the floor, Ambassador. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to see you and to participate in this uh, important event. Let me start by saying a few words on the context, uh, a few words about the position taken by different countries in the region, and then go to the fundamental question that you ask regarding political implications and repercussions. Uh, on the context, I think it's important to indicate that the current crisis is the first test of the global alignment in the great power competition or the, call it the new uh, Cold War, if you wish. Uh, the United States indicated publicly that it uh, hopes that Russia would be defeated and that they are working, that the West is working on weakening Russia to uh, make sure that Russia does not uh, repeat something like what happened in Ukraine uh, and, on, and put a lot of pressure on uh, countries around the world in the United Nations in relation to a number of resolutions. And Russia and China, on the other hand, are saying that the US unipolar world has long gone. And then Russia also started get, getting different treatment for unfriendly countries. So this is a, a test to the leverage of both Washington and Moscow globally, including in the Middle East. As for the positions, I think uh, we have seen a large gap between the positions in the Arab world. There were two countries that strongly uh, opposed the invasion, which were Kuwait and Lebanon. Uh, of course, Syria and Iran were supporting Russia for obvious reasons, and the rest of the countries had varying degrees of hedging. Uh, they felt that they need to balance the approach between uh, Russia and uh, the West. Uh, I think some positions you referred to some of them, including the Emirati vote in the Security Council uh, <clears throat> and other positions were positions that were taken to send a message to Washington regarding not necessarily the war on Ukraine, but regarding other issues pertaining to the relations between these countries and the US. As for the political impact and, uh, and maybe a word or two on the economic impact as well, um, the political impact in the Middle East, I think, will be the biggest impact as compared to other countries uh, and regions around the world. Uh, on uh, the political front, I think the, the outcome of the invasion will have huge uh, repercussions and implications on, on the whole Middle East. Uh, you mentioned a number, of, a number of conflicts and implications. Let me, let me give a few, a few characteristics of how the situation has been evolving. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Libya, uh, Syria, Yemen, and so on. But I also want to, have, to start by uh, the fact that this war was on the verge of the derailing the nuclear deal itself, which of course is seen as something that is uh, positive from uh, the perspective of a number of countries, but the vast majority wants to see a nuclear deal. But, but this war was about to derail this whole negotiating process. In relation to Syria, for example, 
uh, there have been reports coming out from the United States indicating that uh, there is a, a, a situation whereby direct communication between the US and Russia uh, has uh, to de-escalate de tensions in Syria has not been working as efficiently as it used to be. Uh, the CENTCOM commander indicated recently that Russia uh, has been increasingly violating uh, deconfliction protocols. And if Russia ignores these deconfliction mechanisms, the risk of a possible confrontation will rise, which will have a huge impact on, on the situation uh, in, in Syria. Uh, in addition to that, I think uh, how things evolve uh, in, in the conflict with Ukraine will impact the region in a number of other ways, as a number of countries have argued that there is double standards in, in, in the way in which uh, the West dealt with this war. Uh, it became evident that uh, the, West, the West had real political rule when it comes to this war, to try to end this war, uh, a sanction regime that is unprecedented, and so on. And there are countries that are asking, OK, why didn't we see this political will in, in Yemen? Why didn't we see it in Syria? Why didn't we see it in Libya on the Israeli Palestinian front, and so on? And also, uh, the way in which some aspects of this issue had been dealt with, uh, for example, how resistance of the Ukrainians was celebrated, while this is not the case in, in several other places, how, how the International Criminal Court was mobilized while this was not the case also in other situations. The attitude towards refugees and how refugees from Ukraine were treated as opposed to uh, refugees uh, from other places around the world. Uh, the way in which uh, Russian oligarchs were treated before the war and how they were treated after the war and pressure put on countries not to, to welcome them and so on. Um, and I think also another development that will have an impact on the region as a whole is pertaining to the arms situation in the region, including the nuclear weapons. Uh, we have seen uh, the president of Ukraine saying that it was wrong for Ukraine uh, to uh, forego nuclear weapons, although at the time they didn't have a choice, but they still mentioned that. Uh, we've seen also a Russian attitude towards nuclear efforts and so on in a region where, where we already have difficulties pertaining to nuclear programs, including in Iran and the Israeli nuclear capability. So, so this, this, these developments will have impact on, on different uh, crises in the region. I think the countries that had the highest stakes in the region were Turkey and Israel as well, uh, because uh, Israel views Russia as its new neighbor, in, and Russia has allowed uh, Israel to have some free hand in relation to attacking Iranian uh, positions and uh, Hezbollah positions in Syria and so on. And Israel was afraid that if it takes uh, a strong stand in relation to the situation regarding Ukraine, that this may, may affect its freedom of movement in the situation in Syria. So this would also have another implication on on the situation in Syria. Uh, Russia also has all kinds of difficulties uh, with uh, uh, in relation to a number of conflicts as far, far as how they are dealt with between Turkey and Russia. They have differences in, in Syria, they have differences in Libya, they have differences in, in Central Asia and so on. Uh, and Russia feels that, uh, 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 or Turkey feels that Russia may endanger its dreams on several fronts in the region. Um, a, a few words on the economic front, because I think this is this will also have political implications. You mentioned the situation, the humanitarian situation in Yemen, which is the worst in the world. And uh, most of the assistance, as you know, uh, since you've dealt with Yemen for a very long time, uh, most of the assistance is coming through the World Food Program, buying uh, grain from uh, Russia and Ukraine, and this will have a huge uh, impact on the stability of Yemen. Uh, this, the same applies to Syria, uh, that gets most of its uh, uh, grain also from, from Russia and Ukraine. Uh, the situation is the same in relation to Lebanon, that have witnessed 
uh, that is considered by the World Bank as one of the worst economic crises in the last 150 years. And then it, the silos in, in were destroyed when, uh, when uh, the Beirut port was, uh, had uh, witnessed an explosion. Uh, so they have no place to store their wheat except for one month. And 70%, 75% of their wheat was, was coming from both Ukraine and Russia. Uh, in a region where bread is a part of the social contract, and where bread has led in the last few decades to turmoil in different places around the region, uh, including uh, Morocco, Jordan, Egypt, Tunisia, and others. Uh, this is a crucial uh, political issue as well. Uh, let me conclude by saying that the outcome of this war will have significant geopolitical implications for the region. Uh, it is obvious that Russia will aim to exp expand its influence in the Middle East and even beyond the Middle Middle East, including in countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, like Mali, uh, Central African Republic, and so on. And both Russia and China have their own strategy, strategies in relation to how they are going to deal with the evolving global situation. Uh, I think uh, the US does not have a strategy as of yet. They are dealing with this crisis. They are working to see how they're going to deal with uh, China through pivoting through Asia. Uh, to Asia, but there isn't a clear strategy out as to how they will deal with this. As for the countries in the region, they also need to have a strategy. Uh, with my knowledge of what's happening in the region, the fragmentation that the region is suffering from, I doubt that this would be possible collectively, and I doubt that it would be done even in a cooperative manner between a number of a a few countries that are of a uh, similar-minded approach. Uh, which is the second best, but uh, it is also unlikely that this would happen in an effective way. But I think individual countries at, the, at least should start working on this issue because this issue will not go away and it will remain with us for years and years to come. Let me stop here and then we'll be happy to contribute to the conversation later on. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Hisham, for this very rich um, um, uh, intervention. Um, we're delighted to have um, uh, Minister Mangush back online. Uh, Minister Mangush, you have the floor. Hello, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to participate in this uh, important uh, event. A uh, special thank to the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, I have uh, very warm memories as back to 2012 and 13, I worked as a country representative for Libya. So I understand the value of this institution and I understand the importance of the, this work today, especially within the MENA region. Um, as with today, uh, the war in Ukraine, as we know, it has been uh, affected everyone, uh, especially the fragile states, uh, uh, countries, they are struggling with the conflict uh, or fragile peace like Libya. Um, and I'm not gonna speak on behalf of the other uh, MENA region as everyone gonna speak about a specific country, but I'm gonna speak about Libya today as one of the countries within the MENA region. That the, the war in Ukraine affected Libya uh, economically, politically, but also security. Um, and uh, as everyone knows, uh, Libya today is facing very political challenge uh, uh, with different stakeholders uh, and trying to create other parallel governments, government, which can now repeat this in 2014 uh, and 2015. Uh, economically, uh, Libya uh, depends, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in commodities consumed uh, around 80%. Uh, from abroad, uh, which include Ukraine or Russia and other countries. So you can imagine how the situation today could affect economically the situation in Libya. Um, also, the, the raise in the global inflation rates will also directly be inflected uh, on the Libyan economy uh, and also will face difficulties uh, finding alternatives and that could also lead to short supplies. Um, 
the wheat itself, for example, uh, it has been noticed that has been raised uh, recently uh, within the region. And what does that mean when it comes to trade and relationship and uh, how to sustain that balance with the shortage of food or uh, the food security? So this is a huge perspective. Um, uh, I don't have a lot of experience in the economical perspective, but uh, this is what I witness as someone who's in charge with the government today. And I can see it could be a problem with the next few months. Uh, in terms of the security and politically, security, as uh, Mr. Jamal mentioned in the beginning, that uh, we have uh, Russian uh, presence in the ground. What does that mean? Uh, why Libya is the only Arabic country voted against Russia? Um, how fragile state were able to have that decision or make that decision, acknowledging the fact that we are fragile, that we are really in position that is very difficult to us to take a side, but we decided to take a side with the human rights, with ethics and the values that acknowledging what happened to Ukraine could happen to Libya, could happen to any other country. And also uh, refusing uh, the concept of intervention and the concept of uh, using conflict and using weapons against civilians. Uh, well, with that decision, uh, we know it's a risky decision, but also it is decision should be made and should be uh, recorded historically that uh, because of we uh, ignore the indicators in Libya in 2011 and 2012 and 2014 and 2015 and 2018, and we keep ignoring those indicators today, that Libya will not go to better place if we keep ignoring. Um, what I also blame the international community with all our uh, respect, and we are very uh, you know, also sad to the situation in Ukraine, the contradiction when it comes to human rights standards and the human rights violation, and also the idea of stability and security within the region. Uh, if we keep all the attention to one country and ignore the other countries, because this is the excuse, the excuse that I have been hearing now almost for two months. When I speak about Libya with a lot of colleagues, with a lot of international community, they keep saying, well, we are busy with Ukraine now. So my big question today, busy with Ukraine and ignoring the other countries who's facing very dangerous circumstances, uh, is there any international obligation toward that? How to prioritize our attention today within the region and to make state, a clear statement that Libya also matter as Libya matter, as Syria matter, as other countries matter. Libya today in the heart of Africa, North Africa, we are very close to Europe, very close to Italy, Malta, uh, you know, we are neighbors with Tunisia, with the uh, uh, sub sahara with Egypt. Uh, so everything could happen in Libya affect everyone. And we saw that years ago, and we keep seeing it today. So, for example, you know, about the attention in Ukraine, since the international community has shifted their attention dramatically, 100%, I will say, to Ukraine and forget about uh, the rest of the, the world, especially the region, MENA region. Uh, for example, Germany played very, very significant and positive role with Libya through Berlin 1, Berlin 2. And uh, we were very keen to keep the momentum, the political agreement, uh, as this is the last government that they lead to hand power to elected government. But suddenly out of the blue, everybody, uh, you know, uh, felt that, that this is not a priority anymore and we need to focus on something more important. Uh, and uh, I urge the international community today as we speak about Ukraine, as we stand with Ukraine and Libya have a very strong stand with Ukraine from the beginning with all my statements, with all my risky decisions that I made, even I acknowledge I'm a fragile state, that you need to pay attention to Libya as well. Because ignoring the indicators today, being uh, in foggy position and silent toward the position of creating other parallel government 
which against the political agreement, which against Berlin one, which against Berlin two, which against uh, Libyan stabilization initiative that has been conducted last October successfully after 11 years. 30 foreign ministers came to attend that event in Tripoli. And uh, lastly, Paris Agreement, which all those agreements, all that international effort with Libyans effort to support stability and security in the region, acknowledging that there is no answer to other more interim governments. We have been struggling with interim governments since 2011. It's time for Libya now for proper election for elected government to be in charge. Why we keep postponing this? Why we keep ignoring this? So this is, in short, my perspective about the situation, uh, uh, politically security, which is my priority, but also economically. And thank you for giving me the chance to share, uh, you know, the government percep perceptions about the situation, uh, acknowledging that we need to stand also with Ukraine. Uh, we need to stand against any human rights violation in every uh, country. And we need also to work together as a community to support each other and to distribute those priorities. You cannot focus in one country and ignore the rest because this is now priority better more than anybody else. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minister, for your really sobering you know, remarks. And I take from this also um, you know, what you said about um, uh, Libya uh, standing with Ukraine and clearly voting um, in support of Ukraine in General Assembly. And also the one thing that, um, uh, Minister, you highlighted, you know, which is um, with the Ukraine situation capturing the attention of the international community, a number of other urgent situations are falling, you know, from the, um, uh, uh, the screens as uh, we have got used to. Um, usually, uh, the international community is um, interested in a situation, and then something else happens, and um, you know, suddenly, um, um, you know, people just move on. Um, we cannot afford, you know, to. Um, um, uh, not continue to support effort for peace in, in Libya. It's very important you highlighted the geostrategic situation in, um, in, in Libya and the implications for stability uh, um, on Europe, on Sub-Saharan Africa and so on, as we have seen in the last few years. Um, uh, thank you for your remarks. Let me turn now to um, um, our my good friend and colleague, um, um, Sarah Lee. Sarah, you have the floor. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you for this uh, important conversation. Um, I wanted to try to just uh, uh, frame this uh, more broadly, which I know is your intent um, to go beyond the recognition, uh, the realization that this uh, Ukraine war is demonstrating to the world um, that we have intertwined economies, um, but also intertwined militaries with two powers, the US and Russia in particular, with significant st stakes in the region and uh, whose conduct has a very significant bearing on very local matters in every country in MENA. Um, but also, I think that the Ukraine war uh, with respect to the Middle East is showing us that there are also impacts of intertwined laws and norms. Um, we can't separate the actions that the United States uh, and other countries are taking in the Middle East from the actions that the United States and other countries are now taking in Ukraine. And I think one uh, uh, piece of analysis that uh, is missing is this is not just about how the Ukraine war or the Russian invasion of Ukraine is impacting the Middle East. This is also about how decades of uh, uh, bad American policy in the Middle East is now directly impacting the war in Ukraine. Uh, I think there's a major realignment underway and it's a very clarifying moment uh, that we should all be taking advantage of uh, to understand uh, these uh, linkages. Uh, clearly we see the economic impacts, the grain and fuel imports disrupted, the inflation, uh, protests have already broken out in Iraq, the 
uh, Lebanese economy, which has already collapsed, is uh, collapsing further. Uh, the intertwined economies of Egypt, which is not just about wheat uh, and fuel, uh, but also tourism, which is severely disrupted because of a third of, of uh, tourists coming from Russia and Ukraine. Um, the military balance has been upset, and you've already alluded to the impact of uh, the war uh, uh, in uh, terms of the Syrian conflict, uh, where Russian forces have kept the ceasefire in Idlib with Turkey. Uh, and now uh, it's up for grabs um, because what uh, uh, Turkey does or doesn't do with respect to Ukraine um, will directly uh, play out in Syria and impact the people of Syria. Uh, and we know that Idlib will be uh, a football that is kicked around between the Russians and the Turks and the Americans uh, and the Iranians uh, uh, with respect to what they are and aren't doing uh, in Ukraine. And, and similarly, now we see exasperated divi divisions in Libya, uh, noting and, and uh, 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 really uh, thanking the Western government uh, in Libya, the internationally recognized government in Libya, from taking a very, uh, for taking a very strong position to condemn the Russian invasion. Um, but noting that the Western government, uh, given its close alignment uh, with Putin and its close support from uh, uh, Putin's mercy mercenary forces in the East is stuck holding the bag. Um, as I noted, um, I think the clarifying moment, uh, and, and again, I think, uh, uh, Jamal, you uh, alluded to this, um, is that this conflict is really drawing a new red line uh, in terms of who is and is not supporting the United States. Uh, in uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, it's been expected that the uh, uh, authoritarian governments that the United States has been backing in the Middle East uh, for so many decades, um, what we've been told uh, in the United States is that we must support these authoritarian apartheid abusive governments in the Middle East because they support US interests. Um, well, guess what? We're seeing that they don't support US interests. Um, and that in fact, um, what we're seeing is a bazaar, uh, a bazaar as in a bargaining bazaar, a bazaar as in the streets of Damascus bazaar, um, where each of these countries is demanding concessions, local concessions and bartering uh, for what it will and will not do to support the United States in the war in Ukraine. And we've seen this of course most prominently uh, in Saudi Arabia and the UAE, uh, who have said in no uncertain terms uh, that they will increase oil output or may increase oil output if the United States gives them concessions of a written security agreement uh, to defend their countries, to support their countries, their continuing war in Yemen, and I'm very glad that there's a ceasefire, uh, not certain it's for, uh, to hold, but even imagine the concession that Saudi Arabia is demanding of the United States, that the United States intervene in a domestic lawsuit, intervene in the American judiciary to grant Mohammed bin Salman immunity for prosecution, uh, for murdering Jamal Khashoggi, for trying to murder Saad al-Jabri. Uh, and so we are seeing um, this kind of very craven, transparent haggling uh, with the United States. But I think what's different is that the authoritarian axis, the so-called Abraham Accords axis that the United States has actually paid for uh, and brought into creation with US taxpayer supports with very significant political concessions in the region, that axis is now aligned collectively against the United States to demand concessions. Uh, and they are acting as a unified axis in a way that we have not seen before, where we cannot assume uh, that the Abraham axis of authoritarians uh, is going to support the United States. And in fact, when President Blinken tried to have a meeting uh, uh, in Israel with the foreign minister of Israel to rally support, uh, what the Israelis did is brought their authoritarian axis uh, uh, colleagues uh, in basically what was a surprise meeting in the Negev to present themselves as a block. And I think what has not really been examined uh, or, or, or uh, put into the mix is how this block uh, will now act as an independent unit that does not necessarily align um, with the United States. Um, um, finally, I would just say um, that the impact of the war in Ukraine is also revealing the impact of the evisceration of international laws and norms, uh, which the United 
United States has so mildly contributed to in its alliances in the Middle East, um, in support for the war in Yemen, in support for Israel's apartheid government uh, and occupation and annexation, uh, uh, illegal annexation of Palestinian land, in Morocco's unilateral declaration of, of sovereignty supported by the United States and Western Sahara. We are now seeing the chickens come home to roost um, because when the United States is trying to rally global support for the war in Ukraine based on international laws, based on running to the International Criminal Court, which the United States has been trying to destroy for the past decades, uh, based on uh, international values uh, that say you don't take territory by force, you don't invade another country, you can't just annex territory of another country. It's not working um, because those laws and norms have been eviscerated by the United States. Um, so here too, I think we see the way in which the world is intertwined, where we can't separate what happens in Ukraine from what happens in the Middle East uh, but also we can't separate what the United States uh, and its allies, supposed allies, do in the Middle East from what happens in Ukraine. This should lead to a reassessment of US relations in the region and the true cost of American support uh, for dictatorships and apartheid governments in the Middle East. Uh, and 30 members of Congress recently wrote a letter uh, demanding President Biden uh, do so with respect to Saudi Arabia, but I'm not optimistic. Um, I think sadly foreign policy elites, foreign policy leaders, probably not just in the United States, but the ones I see in the United States are stuck in seeing the world only as it is and conceding accepting power configurations as permanent uh, with little appreciation for just how malleable and man-made uh, these things are. Uh, and I think that's why uh, so many American foreign policymakers are now being caught by surprise um, with uh, 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 the bizarre haggling uh, that they're seeing emerge from governments that they thought were their allies, that they thought were their friends, but are not. Uh, I'll pause there. Thank you, Sarah, for the clarity and the straightforward way in which you um, um, you addressed a number of um, pertinent issues in this uh, conversation. Uh, let me turn now to Dr. Abu Yub. Um, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks to all the experts uh, who uh, preceded me in giving this general overview of what's happening in the Middle East and how it is impacted by the war between uh, Ukraine and Russia. What is certain is that this war will have major political and economic repercussions worldwide, but most of all in the Arab world, there is of course, unevenly impacted. Uh, we have the economic aspect. We, we already saw the inflationary trends that are increasing, uh, uh, already weakened economies by the pandemic, uh, exacerbated now by this war. Uh, we see the economic imbalances of uh, payment, deficits, public debts uh, worsening in many of the, in these countries, even though that some other countries in the region are benefiting uh, from the increase, uh, the price of, uh, of oil and gas. And uh, uh, so that's, that's a different situation. Overall, we can say that uh, some MENA countries uh, are heavily dependent on Ukraine and Russia in, as trade partners. And as such, these effects of the crisis will uh, materially impact these economies and will compound the negative effects of, uh, on food security and welfare across the region. So this, this war is impacting the Middle East and North Africa in three principal areas, political negotiations or the political uh, processes uh, and military action, humanitarian and food security, and of course, gas and supplies. Economically, I don't want to go into a lot of details because so much has been said, but we can sum up the main areas of impact in uh, roughly five categories. Food prices shocks, especially issue of wheat, oil and gas price hikes, uh, global risk uh, flight to safety, which could impact uh, private capital flows and um, FDIs in emerging markets as a whole. Uh, fourth, reminiscences, and we know that countries in the region are dependent on this, and of course, tourism, as it was previously stated. Um, let's not forget also that uh, MENA's countries, at least some of them, are um, fragile countries, fragile in the sense of the institutional aspect uh, and governance, and also fragile, uh, economically speaking. Uh, I hear, uh, here I can refer to Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, 
And uh, Yemen, uh, in particular, because it's also uh, one of the uh, four uh, LDCs, least developed countries in the region, which are uh, Mauritania, uh, Yemen, Sudan, and Somalia. Three of these four countries are already impacted by a protracted conflict and crises. For instance, Syria is uh, heavily uh, dependent on uh, on uh, the imports from both two, two, these two countries, two thirds of uh, its uh, food and oil consumption come from these two countries. Uh, Lebanon, which is uh, 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 getting deeper and deeper into the, the worst uh, economic crisis uh, uh, since the 19th century, is uh, dependent for 90% of its grain and uh, has almost no uh, reserves anymore. Yemen, uh, as previously stated, uh, the worst humanitarian crisis, according to the UN, uh, imports more than 40% of its sweet from both of these countries. So people who are experiencing already crisis in Yemen uh, are going to get even hard hit by acute food insecurity. Uh, and just the three last months, the um, food insecure people in Yemen have grown from 15 million to 16 million people. Uh, and it's not going to uh, be any better. And as I said earlier, Yemen is one of the four Arab LDCs uh, who will be mostly affected because it's fragile in, in the absolute sense of the word. Uh, politically speaking, um, and despite the fact that the Houthis have publicly, publicly voiced their support for Russia, uh, I do not believe that Moscow uh, will change uh, the course of its policy towards the conflict in Yemen. Uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates remain more important than ever for Russia, as it is uh, more and more isolated by the Western imposed sanctions. So uh, Russia will not take the risk of changing its stance uh, uh, towards these two countries. And I believe also for these two countries, and it has uh, been seen in the way they voted in the Security Council for the UAE and uh, for both countries uh, in the General Assembly vote, uh, uh, they do not want to alienate uh, Russia either. So it's a win-win situation for these countries for now. The a few words on the reaction of Arab uh, countries uh, towards this crisis has been stated by uh, the colleagues before. Uh, we see that there is a more nuanced uh, uh, diplomatic stance toward Russia these days. Uh, for instance, through its abstention, the Security Council vote, UAE is hedging against diplomatic fallouts with Russia. Only Kuwait, and, and, uh, uh, which was victim of the Iraq invasion in 1990, distinguished itself by explicitly denouncing Moscow. Uh, also in the General Assembly, we saw that uh, Libya stated clearly its position uh, against the invasion and also uh, Lebanon. So a few words on, on the issue of Libya. Uh, uh, I think that the war in Ukraine could upset the fragile balance of power in Libya. Moscow remains one of the key players. Uh, Russia supports alongside of France, uh, ironically, the Benghazi camp played by Field Marshal Haftar. So the presence of the private security company Wagner uh, changed the military situation in the field uh, last year. Uh, Western countries are unfortunately still divided on the Libyan issue, and this uh, will continue to benefit uh, Russia in, in uh, Libya. Uh, Moscow uh, were among, was among the first capitals to welcome the advent of the new uh, government that is uh, um, led by Fatih Bashara. Uh, while uh, this government that is now competing with the uh, Tripoli-based government had carefully at the beginning avoided mentioning the Ukraine crisis during its inauguration, later on came back and denounced the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, I believe that also on the multilateral level, division in the Security Council will likely intensify, which would make the resolution of the Libyan crisis even more difficult. Uh, competition uh, will increase. And as uh, the, the minister said, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Libya said earlier, unfortunately, Libya is now uh, being put at the back burner because other issues are taking precedence for the international community. A uh, few words on the Russia-Turkish coordination in Libya. It, which has helped so far avoid the resumption of uh, nationwide fighting among Libyan factors. Uh, but in, this, is, this arrangement, I believe, in the short term will probably likely to continue because both countries do not want uh, a new fallout. But on the medium and long term, we're not sure that uh, uh, this will, will stay. Over the long term, maybe, 
the restraint could diminish uh, in Libya, especially if Russia decides to escalate, or if Turkey takes a harder line in support of NATO position in the future, or if locally the competing Libyan camps eventually resort to military force. So all these are risks that might increase, uh, especially that we now have the standoff in Tripoli between two rival claimants in the office of prime minister. Uh, so far, there are negotiations and deal makings uh, in Libya, and uh, there's, but there's, there are no guarantees that it will uh, remain the same in, in the future. So the more or the more prolonged the war in Ukraine uh, becomes, the more risk we'll see uh, for, for Libya. And of course, I do not want to repeat the economic fallout for Libya as the Her Excellency the Minister uh, stated that earlier. Uh, Syria is another place also like Libya where Russia is very present uh, and the cooperation is much more needed uh, to find a sustainable political outcomes. Uh, but unfortunately, this also will be affected. Uh, Syria has uh, clearly stated its position uh, in favor of Russia. The Russian considerable military footprints in, in, in Syria and its increase in political and economic isolation uh, may complicate the ongoing efforts uh, to address any political division in Syria. Uh, and to be even more supportive, I think the Russian would be even more supportive now of the Syrian regime and Iranian uh, state uh, as we, we go. Uh, I believe that both political processes, uh, Syria and, um, and Libya, and the importance of the Russian uh, presence there will uh, make uh, things more complicated going forward. Uh, there are other countries that do not necessarily have, uh, are not affected by direct conflict, but also are they, they are fragile because they are either economically and so socially are fragile or because they're going through a transition that is impacted by the the problems in the region and also previously by uh, the, the pandemic. Tunisia is one of them. Tunisia has felt the impact of the Russian war uh, in Ukraine two primary ways, economically, of course, and diplomatically. Uh, Tunisia, whose economy is already under uh, major strength, receives 80% of its sweet from Ukraine. And as a result of this conflict, the prices have soared up and uh, this situation is complicating the, the uh, transition in Tunisia. The Tunisian government, which subsidizes fuels, had planned the budget uh, for um, around an, an oil price of $75 per barrel. And now we know that it's more than $110 uh, uh, per barrel. So I believe that Tunisia, uh, uh, like many other countries in the region, is attempting to walk a fine line between maintaining a good relationship with Russia, upon whom it relies on, uh, relies on heavily for tourism as well as for trade. But at the same time, they're trying to avoid alienating the United States and Europe whose financial and diplomatic support is crucial for Tunisian economy to stay afloat. This is even more important uh, on the diplomatic front. Tunisia's mild position on the Russian invasion has created tensions with, uh, with Europe. For instance, on February 28, the EU ambassador to Tunisia called out Tunisia's attempt at neutrality, stating, and I quote, to rem uh, remaining neutral between the aggressor and the victim is taking a stand. Uh, Tunisia did vote in favor of the March uh, 2nd UN General Assembly resolution denouncing the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but the Tunisian foreign minister highlighted the importance of a bilateral relationship between Tunis and Moscow and its desire to strengthen that relationship. So this diplomatic stance may complicate Tunisia's ongoing negotiations with the International Monetary Fund about a package deal that would help address the numerous economic challenges facing the country. At uh, such a delicate time, then Tunisia's position towards Russia might bear costs that the country uh, cannot afford. So all told, I believe that the region has for some time now facing significant transformation in its political order. To give a sense of the magnitude at the, the regional level, last year the MENA region accounted for only 6% of the world's total population, but over 20% of the world's acutely food insecure people. And the region is home to the largest number of international, internally displaced and refugees globally. So this has created an unstable security environment, which in my opinion most likely will continue to worsen. Uh, the frail political processes and conflict affected MENA countries will continue to stall as division more than cooperation will be prevalent in the UN Security Council. The socioeconomic and political grievances which triggered the uprising in 2011 in MENA 
region are being exacerbated by the economic fallout of the Russia-Ukraine war, and the chance of a steady post-COVID recovery are even slimmer now. There are also increasing concerns about the humanitarian aid and food security in the region, especially for our fragile countries and the least developed countries. The growing number of Ukrainian refugees and the ballooning cost of post-conflict reconstruction could mean that critical humanitarian aid may be diverted from the Middle East, North Africa to address the fallout from the Ukraine conflict. For the millions of Lebanese, Yemenis, Palestinians, Syrians, and others who live in countries experiencing conflict and meltdowns, and increasing humanitarian needs, this would be equivalent to shutting down critical life support. I believe this crisis is also aggravated by significant concerns about uh, food security, especially in countries like Lebanon now with the complete economic meltdown. Uh, in conclusion, I would say that this crisis is likely to worsen and food energy prices skyrocket globally. In time, maybe we could see uh, that this will drive people back to the streets in protest like we saw in 2011. So uh, things are not looking great for the, the region, both economically and politically. I'll stop at this stage and let the debate continue. Thank you. Thank you. You know, we have probably less than 15 minutes, you know, for um, um, uh, questions and answers and further conversation. So I'm um, grateful if you can all be brief. Um, let me go back to where we started with Ambassador Hisham when you spoke about very eloquently about the perceptions in the region about double standards. Um, you know, uh, when it's come to the sanctions regime, um, ICC, refugees, uh, sanctions against oligarchs, and, and, and so on. And then I make the link also with what Sarah said, um, um, you know, about US allies when they are needed um, um, in a very important issue for, you know, US uh, foreign policy interest, um, um, they're reluctant and dragging their feet more or less. I mean, this is not what Sarah exactly said, but that's how I you would um, um, uh, call it. Um, isn't this just um, uh, the issue with the US allies in the Middle East, or is it an issue that is much broader than that? Um, I will explain what I mean. Um, I try to follow a little bit the dynamics in the African group, you know, in the UN, um, um, or the previously non-aligned kind of countries, um, and how they perceive what's happening now. The one thing that uh, you can't help um, 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 uh, not observe is the fact that there is reluctance, you know, from all these countries, you know, that they feel they don't want to be dragged, you know, in support of one side against another, although they say very clearly and from the outset that they're against Russian aggression um, and the violation of Ukraine sovereignty. You know, I listened the other day to the president of South Africa talking about the conflict and um, he highlighted what many don't say you know, in a very loud voice. Um, first, the criticism of NATO countries in the US that they saw this crisis looming. Um, this crisis would be with us for years and for months, uh, we saw this coming, but the international system failed to prevent this escalation and uh, that turned into deadly um, conflict. And, and the heart of this was, you know, the expansion of, the, uh, of NATO um, to include um, uh, countries of the former Soviet Union and um, the reactions um, that um, were known at that time, um, you know, in, in, in Russia to this um, uh, expansion. Um, so um, when you listen to uh, the president of South Africa, clearly, you know, he, you know, he represents a uh, a major trend among UN member states and particularly the African group and beyond Africa, really, um, you know, which is um, 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 a group of countries trying to reposition themselves and find a way on how they can reconcile their condemnation of the act of aggression by Russia, but at the same time, um, uh, they're very cautious about how the West the West, the US and the West has been handling, you know, this conflict. Um, so um, 
the, the question that you know I would like uh, uh, to ask here is uh, if, if you can, you know, comment on how what's the most likely scenario, you know, in terms of the uh, countries of the MENA region, and based on what we have seen, how do you think that position may evolve as we see the conflict um, becoming more complicated and expanding? Hisham, if you'd like to start, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bermel. Uh, it, it is complicated, uh, but the countries of the region, as it was mentioned, uh, do not want to be dragged to take sides clearly. So they want to be able to, uh, you know, hold the stick from the middle if this is possible. This is made much more difficult by both the US and Russia that wants countries to take a clear stand. Uh, at the same time, uh, you mentioned Africa, for example. Uh, 17 out of the 35 countries that abstained on the UN General Assembly resolution are from Africa. And I think they wanted to send a message to the United States and including also uh, other countries like uh, uh, United Arab Emirates in its Security Council vote. Uh, it wanted to send a message in relation to uh, the attack that took place against the United Arab Emirates in, uh, from the Houthis, uh, uh, the F-35s, and so on. So Saudi Arabia as well. Saudi Arabia felt uh, that it wasn't, uh, didn't receive adequate support from uh, the United States when it was attacked by the Houthis that led to having 50% of its oil uh, exports uh, halted. So, so the perception is that from a number of countries in the region, whether they're right or wrong is a different story, is that they need the United States to do more. The United States at that time is also seen as a country withdrawing its footprint from the region. So, and Russia at the same time is seen as a country that strongly supports its allies. And they've seen that in, in Syria, they've seen that in the support to, to Haftar and so on. So there is a, a, a difficulty faced by these countries uh, that do not want to, to make this choice or do not want to be forced to make this choice. Uh, the United States also suffered from a huge image problem as a result of what happened in Afghanistan. So this whole picture is a complicated picture that countries are analyzing. They're trying to see where their interests lie and they're trying to see how they can uh, achieve their interests in the best possible way. Don't forget also that, that, that when the United States withdrew some of its uh, uh, military equipment from Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia went and they had a military cooperation agreement signed with Russia, and they went with, with China to produce missiles uh, in Saudi Arabia in order to see how they can defend themselves. So the picture is complicated, and countries will continue to try to maneuver to try not to take sides because for them, the US is crucial and extremely important. And despite the fact that it is withdrawing from the region, they still feel that it is the most critical player in the region. So they don't want to uh, have an impact on their relations with the US, but at the same time, they don't want to compromise their relations with Russia. Thank you, Ambassador Hisham. Can I turn to Sarah for, um, a, a comment on, on, on this issue. Yes, definitely a complicated picture. Um, countries of the region trying to maneuver, looking for their best interest, balancing, trying to do a balancing act. Where is this going? What are the most likely scenarios here from uh, everything I mean, that we've seen so far? Uh, I, I, uh, it's it's a very unpredictable moment um, because there is this evolution of a new bloc uh, in the Middle East um, that the Ukraine war has, I think, brought into further clarity. Uh, and we don't know yet how uh, uh, Egypt's independent relationship with the United States and independent bartering with the United States or Saudi Arabia's or the UAE's, how this will be impacted by their making collective demands as a collective bloc um, for their security. And, and, and I think it deserves uh, greater scrutiny and it deserves to see whether this bloc will in fact act like a bloc or whether it will be that Saudi and the UAE are the bosses 
uh, and their junior partners, uh, Egypt and uh, Morocco and Jordan and Bahrain will merely uh, uh, tag along. Um, I think the dilemma is, um, and, and it's important what language we use to describe this, um, we have authoritarian unelected uh, apartheid rulers uh, who are demanding that the United States continue to do bad things in the region, support the war in Ukraine, support Israeli apartheid, support illegal annexation in land, uh, in exchange for the United States, in exchange for support for the United States challenging those bad things uh, by Russia in Ukraine. And in a sense, it's an impossible position. And this is why there isn't greater support for uh, the US, for uh, the US positions that the US wants the world to take vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Russia's invasion, illegal invasion, illegal uh, war crimes uh, in, in Ukraine, because it continues to do the very same things and continues to support governments to do the very same things uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and I think it's true the Biden administration has tried uh, to slightly, I would say, uh, lift a finger off of the fist uh, of scale in support of these uh, authoritarian governments and their war crimes and their illegal acts and their torture and abuse and oppression. Uh, uh, but it has done very little in that regard. And now um, these same governments are basically uh, in a position of power to uh, demand and, and try to extract concessions and to try and ex uh, 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 force uh, um, leverage of further concessions uh, for what the United States wants to do in Ukraine. It's, it's, not, it's, it's certainly not an intellectually or legally or politically coherent or sustainable position. It's not a story that the United States can explain uh, in a single language and straight face to the whole world. Uh, basically what it comes, what it's come down to is the United, the demand is that the United States support war crimes in Yemen, support the bombardment of children in Yemen, uh, in exchange for saving the children of Ukraine and saving the people of Ukraine from illegal bombardment. It's, it's incoherent. Uh, and I think this is why there is confusion. And this is why we don't really know how this is going to play out in a global scale. In the best case scenario, it will lead to people to realign to the laws and the norms that we understand in Ukraine, we all need uh, desperately to protect us. The United States, the whole world, we need the International Criminal Court to step in and take a clear position on what's happening in Ukraine. But how can we do that when the United States has been kneecapping uh, the International Criminal Court and kneecapping the prosecutor, sanctioning the court, the prosecutor, their staff, their families, because they dared to investigate what Israel is doing uh, in, uh, in, in, in uh, Palestine? Um, these are tectonic sort of frictions, uh, and and they're uh, they're not just a conflict of interests; they're a conflict of ideas and valuables and principles. Um, and we're being called upon as a global community to stand for international values and laws and principles. Uh, but the problem is the U.S.'s conduct uh, does not measure up to those values and principles, and that's why people are not buying it. Uh, neither the so-called allies, they're scoffing, uh, neither the international community, neither the African states, uh, uh, neither the, the, the many of the Latin American states or the Asian states. Um, and if the priority is to save democracy, to save international law, to, to stand for justice and against illegal invasion, we have to do that everywhere or the project fails. And I, I hope that Ukraine is serving as a clarifying moment for that. We really hope so, um, um, but uh, as, as all of you um, uh, try to explain, it is a very complicated picture um, and it will continue to be complicated as um, this situation um, uh, evolves. Um, countries basically are going to uh, try and do what is in their best interest, um, trying to navigate, you know, the um, uh, their interest, you know, between um, Russia and China. We know that Russia and China have had um, have expanded their interest in 
uh, in Africa and uh, their um, interests have uh, developed um, and their involvement you know has evolved you know look at the Russian role in Central African Republic in Mali in the Sahel um, all this is is very interesting and um, um, we'll see uh, what's what's the um, uh, what will happen in in Libya you know with you know the presence of Libya and their support for one side in um, uh, in the conflict um, uh, in Syria also um, uh, Russia is present. Um, Russia has been shaping events in Syria, and um, it was thanks to Russia that uh, the government um, um, has survived, largely survived. And although the crisis is not is not over, um, I agree that um, we, when, when it comes to Yemen, I'm not. I don't think that we will see. A departure from uh, the usual Russian position uh, that was mm -hmm. best explained to me um, in April 2015 by um, the former Russian ambassador to the UN when he told me that look, you know, if the P3 have bilateral interest, um, you know, with Saudi Arabia, we also uh, uh, have bilateral interest and. Um, have uh, are looking for business opportunities and for developing trade and um, so therefore they should not count on us to be the ones to torpedo um, the resolutions that they may not like um, that's how uh, resolution 2215 was adopted um, the resolution that basically legitimized in inverted comma um, saudi oe intervention in yemen the resolution that basically asked one side to surrender to the other when the one side the Houthis were in control of more than 50% of territory and they still asked them to um, surrender to some people living in a hotel in Riyadh. Um, so um, the Russian position at that time was interesting and um, we've seen it in more recent uh, discussions in the Security Council. Uh, I think what will prevail really is the business interest of the P5. Um, their business interest is for this um, is to maintain a good relationship with Saudi Arabia. And they will all continue uh, to do that. But when it comes to the other two conflicts, Syria and, and, and Libya, the situation will be is unpredictable because of the uh, variety of um, um, uh, factors and um, and um, actors who are involved uh, in this uh, situation. We have come you know, to the end of our uh, conversation. Um, um, thank you all for uh, finding the time uh, to meet and participate. Um, we just scratched the surface really in this first conversation. Um, these issues, as we said repeatedly, are complicated and um, uh, need to be explored in more depth. And uh, that's why I hope that this will be just a, a first conversation in a series of more in-depth discussion that maybe can go deeper into each of the situation that you know, we uh, discussed in this meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, unless um, uh, any one of you uh, has something urgent and succinct to, to say, I would declare that we can, we've come to the end of our meeting. Thank you very much. Ian. Thank you. Thank you. And um, uh, see you soon, um, I hope, in another conversation. Thank you. Bye-bye.